everybody and welcome to our fall teacher education program induction ceremony and student teaching send off. Sorry, there you go. I'm being adjusted. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm Sarah Pennington. I'm the department head for the education department and I'm also a former middle school teacher. Give me a raise a hand if somebody in here is a middle school person. They want to go for middle school. Those are my people. I love middle school. It is an honor and a privilege to welcome those of you who are just entering our teacher education program and to send off and wish well those of you who will be going into student teaching next semester, which is sometimes daunting but always exciting opportunity to really grow your skills and to start moving from being a student to truly embodying the professional that we want you to be in the classroom. For tonight, we have a wonderful guest speaker who I'm going to introduce. She is one of our faculty members in educational leadership. She has also been a constant within this state for quite a while. If you have a principal in the state of Montana, chances are she has helped to train them. Your superintendents, same deal. She has truly, through her work with our program as well as her outreach, helped to shape education across the state of Montana, and I would say she's definitely made a mark that will be remembered for many years. So I would like to welcome up to the podium, Dr. Tina Versland. Okay, I just broke this. <laughs> no, seriously, I just did. Oh, I just broke it. You. <laughs> so, I just broke the mic stand. <laughs> I can start. Um, okay, well, this is this. I'll get be, it back. All right, this will be entertaining. We have a record of this, of me not fixing this. Oh, what did you do, T? <laughs> it's that superhuman strength. I don't know. It's, it screws on there. See, there are threads. It does. Just hand her the mic and roll. Yeah. You're just, you're just going to have to do this. No. My pockets, but Sorry. No, no hands in pockets, T. Sorry. sorry. I, I'm sorry that I broke the mic stand. The Department of Education is probably going to have to pay for it, and I'm sure this is going to come out of my paycheck at some point in time. So I guess I, I deserve that. But yeah, like Sarah said, the, my biggest worry was not the mic stand tonight. My biggest worry was, can I see over the podium? And the answer to that was no. And so I thought, OK, all right, you're going to have to stand to the side. So my name is Tina Versland. Um, I am a three-time Bobcat. I got my music education degree here um, way before most of you were even thought about. And I got my master's here in 89. And I got my doctorate here. And um, I started my teaching career as a music teacher way up in the northeastern corner of Montana in this little teeny town called Opime. Does anybody know where Opime is? OK, yeah, great. OK, anybody from up around there? Okay, so I had I spent six amazing and wonderful years in Opime. I got to do as the music teacher, I got to do everything. I was the band director, I was the choir director, I taught little teeny kids how to march and sing at the same time. Um, I, I did all kinds of uh, Christmas musicals and all those kinds of things, beginner band, intermediate band. Everything, I got to do everything. I coached basketball, I coached volleyball. I was the first female football official in the state of Montana because we didn't have anybody else in our community that knew football. And so uh, I got to wear those crazy black and white stripes too and try to avoid uh, football players crashing into the sideline, crashing into me. It was the absolute best experience of my life to that point in time. I loved every minute of it, I loved my students. I uh, had a wonderful time, and then somebody came along to me and said, 
you should be a school administrator. And I thought, what? I'm having so much fun as a teacher. But that thought about being a school administrator worked on me for a long enough time that I decided, you know what, I, I think I might give that a try. So I came back to MSU, came into our program, uh, spent a couple years getting my master's, became a school administrator, uh, got sick the day of graduation. I came down with uh, mononucleosis and that was uh, in May and I, I was not able to apply for jobs and go out and uh, apply for jobs and I thought, oh man, I'm just gonna have to like, I don't know, work at a gas station or something like that, which wouldn't, wouldn't have been a bad gig at that point in time. Wouldn't have paid for my loans, but, um, and lo and behold, the thing that happened was just really fortuitous. They tell you, or they used to, say things like, oh, you can never go home. So once you get your degree, you gotta go somewhere else. You should never probably go back home because there will be all these unreasonable expectations of you and all this kind of stuff. Well, what happened to me? I got sick, I couldn't go anywhere to interview, and lo and behold, the perfect job comes up in my hometown. So what do I do? I apply for it, thinking, you know what, I can't go home, I shouldn't do that. I got the job. 23 years later, um, and two different jobs, I was high school assistant principal for a while, uh, and then I was longtime middle school principal. I was principal of the year twice. I was one of 50 uh, principals across the nation that was honored uh, in the mid-90s for student achievement and things like that. I thought my teaching career was amazing. My administrative career was even better than that. And so um, then somebody said to me, you should get your doctorate. And I thought, no, nah, I don't want to get my doctorate. I'm having such a good time as a principal. That worked on me long enough. I did get my doctorate. I came up here, got my doctorate. And then lo and behold, a job came open up here at MSU for me to use that doctorate and for me to start training principals and superintendents. And so when I say I'm a long-term bobcat, that is the truth. Uh, you know, man, since 1977, long-term bobcat, that's me. And happy to be here, happy to speak with you all today, and happy to tell you that you are getting into the profession that is absolute, the best you can do, because everything else that goes on in the world whether you're a doctor, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're you know, an ambassador, anything else depends on who you had as a teacher and all those influences. That's who you guys get to start thinking about being. And that's who you are today. And I'm glad that we do this ceremony and kick things off this way and show you our appreciation. I've got a few things up here that I'm gonna try to give you a little advice. I thought, God, what, what do I talk about to these guys? You know, I could go into all kinds of research and all kinds of stuff like that. You hear about that all the time, so I won't talk about that. But I thought, you know what? What's the advice I would have given to my younger self and hope that my younger self may just have listened? So that's what I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about tonight is some advice, but a few other things too. So I hope I don't break anything else up here and, uh, Okay, I, do you want to come up and run it then? Uh, okay, all right. Okay, so how many of you know Dr. Sarah Schmidt Wilson? Know her and love her, yep, she's crazy, isn't she? And how about Dr. Nicole Winego? Anybody here know Nicole as well? Okay, she's a faculty member right now in uh, family and consumer science. So these are two of my really good research partners. And we've been asking ourselves questions and really wanting to drill down and know more about you all as brand new graduates and, and try to drill down so we can understand why do you take the jobs that you take and what are those things that inspire you to become teachers. So in the past few years, about three years, we did two different surveys. We asked 450 of our past graduates uh, several different questions, and here's what we found out, and this is just the tip of the iceberg, but I thought this was really interesting to tell you all tonight or share with you. And one thing that, that stood out to us, not surprisingly, is that 72% of our graduates said they chose to be an educator because they wanted to make a difference. Does that land with anybody here that you're choosing this path because you think you can make a difference? Yep. Yeah, and you know what, you're right on. You can make a difference, and you're the, only, you're the only people that are going to be able to do that, so thank you for that. 
51% of our folks said, I decided to become a teacher because I had this amazing teacher in fourth grade, in eighth grade. I had this amazing teacher when I was a sophomore in high school and they kept me in school and they did all kinds of things for me and they were funny and I loved going to their classroom every day and they saved me. 51% of our students said that. They were influenced by a former teacher. 24% said, guess what? I had parents who were teachers and we kind of look at education as the family business. Is that true for anybody here? Anybody have parents or uh, aunts and uncles, people like that, people in your family? Okay, yeah, we, we know that we, we tend to share those great experiences with our family and we want them to be in a good place as well. So we talk about education to our families. And finally, you know, one of the things we ask people about, what's your greatest satisfaction? And that kind of goes with number one too. They said relationships with colleagues and our students brings me the greatest satisfaction as a teacher. And that will be true for you as well. You get into this, whether you know it or not right now, you're, you are a relational being. And by that I mean you value relationships with other people. That's the thing that makes you feel good. When you establish those relationships and you have those close contacts with people, you do things with your best buddies, all those kinds of things, that piece of yourself that is relational is exactly why you get into education because you crave that. And you know what, in our world today, man oh man oh man folks, we need relationships more than probably anything else. Okay, so a little bit of, little bit of advice. First of all, I was really nervous when I first went to student teach thinking that I didn't know everything. Well guess what? You don't have to be perfect. No one is. It takes what we know now from research, it takes about 10 years for somebody to be considered a master teacher, okay? Because you can't just learn everything you can in, a, in one program in four years at, at MSU, no matter how good we are, we're not that good, okay? Nobody is. But it's gonna take you about 10 years to become a master teacher. You need time to experience things and you need a ton of different experiences. You need to experience a bunch of different personalities too. That's how we grow, is understanding how we relate to other people. And you know what? That's just one of those things where we keep doing it and we get a little better and a little better and a little better. None of us can, none of us can know that right off the bat. So, you don't have to worry about being perfect. Your cooperating teachers and your administrators, they know you're not perfect. All they expect you to do is to come and be open to new things and to give an honest effort. That's what they want, it's that simple. You just have to show up every day, be open to new things, and give it a good MSU Bobcat try. So I'd say relax. You don't need to be perfect, you just need and you don't have to know everything or be everything, okay, on the first day, just be open to things. But I will say too, you know more than you think you do, so don't go in there thinking, oh, I, I don't know any of this, what should I, no, 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 you, you know more than you think you do. And it's not just what you've learned up here at MSU, you're relational beings. So you've had these great relationships every, ever since you've been this high. Ever since you were on the playground and you were the one to organize the kickball games. Ever since you were in middle school and you were the one trying to keep the mean girls from attacking each other or whatever was going on. You have those kind of things in your history. You guys are laughing, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You have that, so you know what? Don't sell yourself short either. You know more than you think you do. You might be thinking, God, I don't know, what do I have to offer? Well, okay, you're not a master teacher, but you do possess a lot of different attributes that people value and they appreciate. One of the first things, you being the ages that you are, people appreciate is this sense of energy and enthusiasm that you have right now. Those of us that look like me with white hair, gray hair, colored hair, I won't mention a uh, faculty who do that or anything, but anyway, um, you know, that enthusiasm kind of wanes after a while. And we get enthusiastic if we wake up every day, okay? That's a big deal is that we're alive still, all right? So the fact that you guys bring that sense of energy and enthusiasm is huge. 
We love this about you. You are idealistic. You know what? We used to be that way. We used to be that way. Those were people that, those of us who have color, hair this color, we used to be really idealistic. And sometimes the world sort of beats it out of you. And there are days when we feel like, ugh. And then we see you all. <laughs> and you come into our schools. You know, and you've got that idealism. You think you can grab every tiger by the collar and do whatever you want. And that reminds us of who we used to be and what those feelings are that we used to have. And we think to ourselves, bless you guys. Bless you for showing me that again. That is totally important. And, and when you come into a new school with that sense of idealism and wanting to do well and wanting to reach every child, that's a beautiful thing. You represent this piece of beauty that some of us have forgotten. So that, that is huge. And, and I tell you right now, thank you for that. Um, you pre represent a better future. Okay, we rely on you, we're relying on you right now to illuminate the way forward. People in my generation, maybe a generation older than me, maybe a generation younger than me, we've goofed a lot of things up. I mean, we really have. And I don't know that it's within our power to change all these things and to make them better. I certainly know it's within your power to do it though. So we rely on you. You are the best versions of ourselves, and you're the better future that we really want for ourselves and want for everybody. Here are a few strategies that I think will really make a difference and are really helpful. The first one is whether you're going to be a student teacher or whether you're brand new and you're just getting ready to get into practicum. The most important thing you can do, learn the names of all your students. Okay, if you're gonna be an elementary teacher, you gotta have that stuff down the first week. Okay, know their first name, know their last name, try to learn something about them, but know their names because you, you say you wanna have a relationship with people, you can't have a relationship with someone unless you know their name. Who's your friend? Uh, I don't know. Well, you, you don't have that friend then. If you want to have a relationship with someone, the first thing you gotta do is know their name. And that's so true for kids, you know? Remember when you were little and your mom would say things like, Sarah Jo? If she just said something like, middle daughter? You know, that wouldn't be, it wouldn't have nearly the power, would it? No, but we all like to be called by our names because we're all individuals. All right, I'm not just a faculty member, I'm Tina. And Tina has a meaning for me, just like all your kids and their names have meaning for them. When you call them by their names, you show them that you care about them. That's a huge thing. Greet your students at the door every single day. Stand outside the door, you know, maybe you guys have seen some of the videos where, you know, they'll have the like special handshakes and all that stuff. You don't have to do that, but if you want to, great. But stand outside the door and greet your students every day because several reasons. Number one, you create that welcoming environment. We always tell you at MSU, it's really important to create a welcoming environment. We may never tell you how to do that though. Here's a super easy, dirty way that you can do it. And all it takes is standing in front of the door. You can do that. High five them as they come in, practice their names. Easy, easy, easy. The second thing about greeting them at the door is that it allows you to set the tone for the day. You get to kind of decide, I'm the one that's in charge here, I'm the one that's gonna roll with this, I'm gonna tell us what we're doing, my enthusiasm is gonna carry over to everybody else. But you can also see when you have a student that comes your way who maybe seems off, Maybe they're a little sad, maybe they're mad, maybe something's going on. You get a chance to just pull them aside for a second and say, wait here for a minute, just hang on for a sec. You greet everybody else, and then when everybody's in the classroom, then you spend a couple minutes with that person trying to figure out what's going on. Are you okay? Can I do something for you? What? And you find out, you find out what's happening, and sometimes, it's 30 seconds that you're gonna spend with someone that will diffuse all the problems that would have gone on for the next 50 minutes. It's so worth it. And you know what? 
you stop them, you ask about how things are going, you just communicated to them again in a really important way that they matter. You think they're going to behave a little better for you? You think they're going to try a little harder for you? You're dang right they will. That's huge. Greet them at the door. Think about that. Put that, write that down, put that in your, in your mind for later. Get to school early. How many of us are, are used to, as college kids, sliding in that desk with about six seconds left to go before, does he do that? You just pointed at him. <laughs> oh, she does. Oh. She is the early bird. Oh, okay, good. And so. And I was joking. Oh. <laughs> okay, let's talk after, okay? <laughs> All right. But get to school early because you know what? When you're a student teacher, when you're brand new, you're kind of nervous, all right? If you get there at the last minute, that nervousness is just going to amplify. So get there, get yourself settled, get all your stuff ready. Even if you look at your watch, like, okay, so this thing started at 5.30. Actually, it started at 5.42, which was 12 minutes late. But any, anyway, um, <laughs> I was here at 4.00. I've done these kind of things I don't know how many times. I still get here early because I get nervous. I need to get myself situated. I need to think about what I'm going to say. It works, people. I had a chance to um, go through my stuff. I had a chance to relax. I had a chance to shop online on my phone. All those really important things. I had a chance to work out so I could break the mic. Um, anyway. Get there early, okay? You're going to feel so much And this is an important but a really easy thing to do. Lastly, well, not quite lastly, but don't wait to ask for help. You are not going to offend anyone or put anyone out if you ask for help, okay? Don't just think, oh my god, everybody else knows this but me. No, they don't. You're prob there are probably some teachers in your building who have been hired and are there three or four years that might have the same question that you do, and they have never asked it. So don't be afraid to ask. We know that you don't know everything. It makes us feel good when you act like you're interested enough to ask and really want to do things well. So don't hesitate one bit to ask for help. Um, you know, your job is to be a teacher, yeah, but your job is to learn too. And you got to be that sponge. So make sure that you ask for help and ask for help early. Okay. What do we do for, what are some strategies for helping our students be successful? Number one, be consistent, okay? Say what you mean and mean what you say. Most students can abide by realistic expectations uh, if, you, if you let them know what's expected. And you've got to know what is it that you expect. What is that? You can't be wishy-washy about it. You can't expect this one day and then this another day. It, You've got to go in and know what it is that you want and make sure that you communicate that and then make sure you follow through. If you tell kids that there's going to be some kind of a penalty because if they do A, B, or C, if they do that, you've got to put the penalty down. You really do. You have, to, you have to make them go through that. Because if you don't, nothing else that you say is going to matter. And you might be thinking, oh man, that's harsh and I want people to like me. And you know what? They're going to like you just fine. They're going to have a hard time, though, if you're inconsistent. They're going to have a hard time liking you if these kids get away with doing this, but these kids don't, OK? They're going to like you just fine. You don't have to try to be their friends. You don't have to try to get them to like you. The fact that you're idealistic, the fact that you're there, that you know their names, that you're concerned about them, they're going to like you just fine. You don't have to, like, you know, mortgage yourself or anything like that to, to try to get people to like you. Never, ever, ever, ever punish a whole class for the actions of one student. I had a friend say this to me once when we were talking about a, another teacher in our building who decided to punish a whole class for something really stupid that one kid did. And they actually got into kind of, these two teachers actually sort of got into a, a verbal uh, exchange, let's say, at a faculty meeting about this. And I'll never forget what was said. One of my teachers said, how would you like it if your paycheck was cut in half because your colleague was late to school and your administration thought that peer pressure would solve the problem? 
It's not up to a, and, and so we laughed about that, but it's true. Don't think that you're going to make one student behave better by having everybody else in the class put peer pressure on them. No, that's never gonna happen. And those other kids don't deserve that. It's not up to a nine-year-old or a 12-year-old to control the behavior of their peers. That, it's not up to them. It's up to you. You're the professional, you're the one with all the knowledge, you're the teacher, okay? You're the one that figures out how to do that. And if you don't know how to do it, go back to number one, ask for help, okay? But don't, don't punish the whole class or even a group of students for what one student does wrong. You guys wouldn't like that. You know, none of us do. Think about that, that happens frequently. Call parents before a big issue comes up. If you can figure out ways to congratulate parents or say something really positive about their students to them before there's any kind of a problem, before parent-teacher conferences, way ahead of time, do that. You will not believe how many great things come back to you in terms of parent support, uh, students behaving better, all kinds of things. So make sure when you communicate home for the first time, it's something good. Okay, even if you have to make it up. Okay, somebody said, hey, I'm a choir teacher. How, you know, we don't really take tests or anything. How do I, talk about how they sing, talk about how they look, talk about their stage appearance, talk anything. You know, send those positive messages home. We all like to hear that. And as parents, really important for us to hear that about our kids. So make sure that you communicate and say something positive. Look for ways to see your students excel outside the classroom. Attend their sports events, their art shows, their concerts, and then make sure you acknowledge their performance. So you go to the concert, and then when you see that student the next day, you go, wow, I, I could tell by watching you sing that you love to sing and that you understood the lyrics behind that song so much, I could hardly watch anybody else. You say that to a, a student, and pretty soon you are like, held in this crazy high esteem. It doesn't take much, folks. This thing, this relational thing that you already know, remember from when you were here, it's the same thing. You just keep doing it over and over and over. Ah, some general observations. I think it's really good to be aware of what goes on or what's gone on in certain towns and schools. Some of you that are gonna go out and student teach, you may be going to a completely different place that you don't really know anything about. It's good to understand the history of the place because that's gonna tell you a lot about why things are done the way they're done. And so when you go there, if you can talk to your cooperating teacher or even your school administrator and just ask some general questions about, can you tell me a little bit about the history of the school and what I should know? as I'm here student teaching, what are things about the community that are really important that I know? I'll tell you kind of a funny story. When it was probably, I guess it was my first year teaching, and when I was in, when I taught in Opheim, the year that I was hired, there were about six or seven of us about my age that were all hired at the same time. And when we were in college, when we were at MSU going out, our faculty members told us, whatever you guys do, stay out of the bars. Well that, okay, we got it, we got it, we got it. Stay out of the bars, don't go, don't go to the bar and drink or anything like that, don't go have a beer, don't do any of that stuff when you're in your first or second year teaching. We took that to heart. So here we are in Opime and it's like, well probably November-ish. We haven't been in the bar at all, you know, nobody has seen us, we've been really good. We get called into the superintendent's office and the superintendent, and there are six of us, and the superintendent looks at us and says, I need to talk to you guys about being in the bar. And we're like, we, we, we haven't been in the bar. We, we haven't been there. That's, we have, none of us have been in the bar. And he goes, I know. People are mad that you haven't been in the bar because in this community, that's where you go talk to people and meet people. And the people in the community expect you to go to the bar and spend a little money because they pay your salary. And so we thought, Yoo-hoo! We get to go to the bar finally, right? But you know what? If we'd have listened to someone else and didn't know that about our community, we'd have really stayed on the wrong foot all the time. But that expectation was, in some small communities, the bar is not just the bar that we think of at, in Bozeman. It's the place where people gather. 
You know, you'll see as many little kids in the bar as you will older people, because that's sometimes the only place in town that's open all the time. And that's where people go. And we didn't know that. So it was really important that we s understood some of the culture differences in these little places. And the same can be true for you. So make sure that when you go to your places, you, s you, try, to look, you try to look into what that culture of your school is or what that culture of your community is. It's really important to how well you're going to be accepted and fit in. Okay, you're going to experience situations and philosophies that are different than what you've been taught at MSU. And you know what? That's a good thing. Like I said before, we're pretty good here at MSU. We don't know everything, okay? It's too big. This field is too big. Each of us that are your faculty members have our own ex ex have our own experiences. But we don't have all the experiences. We just have what we have. So when you go out and you learn from other people, suddenly now you're going to learn more and more and more. And don't just think, oh gosh, if it's different than MSU, it must be wrong. Or MSU must be wrong. Nah, this is kind of your place in time to take all this information in and say, hmm, which of, what of these things resonates most with me? And what am I going to, what feels best to me? And what am I going to, what is representative of who I am? And that's what's going to be important to you, okay? Understand that, that what you learn student teaching is only one way of doing it. I know some people who student taught with someone and they never changed anything for 30 years. Okay, your job is to grow. You know, student teaching is one way of looking at it. It's one way of doing it. But when you get into your own school and take a job later, you've got all these magnificent colleagues that you're going to learn from. So you know what? You just keep growing in that, okay? There are plenty of ways to do things, and it's important to be open to do that. Remember that with time, you will develop and grow into the best version of your teacher self. But it takes time. That master teacher stuff, 10 years. It takes time. Be patient with yourself. Oh, she's finally done talking. I just want to say thank you. And, and I honestly mean that. I want to say thank you, first of all, for embracing the best and the highest professional ideals that we know that this profession of being a teacher and being an educator, those are some of the highest professional ideals that there are. Because you know what? We have to take every single child who comes our way, whether we like them, whether we don't, whether we agree with, with their uh, political beliefs or their parents' political beliefs, whether we don't, it's not up to us. We're all welcoming. But in being all welcoming, we're all powerful. Okay? We are all powerful because we are all welcoming. So thank you for that. Thank you for believing that all kids deserve your effort and are worth your effort. Because you know what? You guys were those kids one time, and your teachers thought that you deserved their efforts too. And you did. And now you're in that place to pay that back. Everybody, all those kids deserve your best effort. So thank you for that. Thank you for being the light in the next generations for us. You're going to have to get it done because folks my age are not, are not we're not getting it done, people. It's going to be up to you. You're going to be the you're going to be the generation that does it. So thank you ahead of time for that. And finally, thank you for deciding that being a teacher is who you are. Okay, kind of wraps up my remarks. Thanks for listening and being polite. And I wish you the best. Our department wishes you the best. Don't be a stranger. Ask questions. Ask for help. Um, you know, call us up. Send us an email. Whatever you need to do, we're there to help you. We are invested in you for you to become the best you can be. Okay? That's our job. But you know what? It's more than that. It's what we believe, too. So thank you very much. Have a good evening. Congratulations, you all that are going to go out and student teach. Have a great time. Um, stay out of the bars or go to the bars. I'm not sure which. Uh, figure that out before you get there, OK? Have a good night. Thank you very much. I will let you do that. Okay.
Sweet. All right, I'd love to give another round of applause to Tina for that amazing talk. So now we are going to welcome our new inductees to the program. And so as your name is called by Dr. Hicks, um, please come up. I'll be giving you your name tag. Uh, this is the name tag that you'll wear when you start your practicum experiences. Um, our dean calls this the pin that gets you in. Wearing this name tag shows the world that you are one of our Bobcat teacher candidates. Bill Beller. <laughs> Maya Clark. <laughs> Isaiah Duff. <laughs> Heidi Ernst. Caitlin Ferry. Morgan Flamond. Lola Gannett. Toby Hamilton. Delaney Jarrett. Landon Kiker. Peyton Menholt. Riley Moore. Kenzie Shell. Julia Spots. <laughs> Kayla Labate. <laughs> and Joshua Foster. If anyone who is here to be inducted was missed, uh, please come up at this time and we'll make sure we get to you properly recognized. Awesome. All right, and now the amazing John Milik will be coming up to um, introduce our student teachers. And uh, student teachers, as you come up, um, I'll be handing you a lovely MSU journal and then please, all the student teachers, just kind of hang out here in the corner, uh, make a nice little line. John will explain why. I can't find my notes. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. It's great to see all the new people and uh, it's really fun to see all of our student teachers as you're getting ready to make that last kind of journey out and um, do all the great things that Tina was talking about. What we want to do tonight is, uh, one, get your, your handshake with the department head, and then we're going to ask you to give advice to the new students. And what I want you to be thinking about for a minute is, what do you wish you knew about this program when you started? What are the important things to be aware of? What rumors to avoid? Um, you know, what are maybe some of your strategies to be successful in the program? And uh, we're gonna have you share those with everybody. You're in a very different place. And so what I'm gonna share with you now is uh, Joe and Ginny and I just spent the last couple days reviewing all of the outstanding student teacher nominations for fall of 2024. 
we had some great things happening with our student teachers this semester. But I'm going to tell you what the teachers told us were important and what the outstanding student teachers did. So uh, the first thing, and, and there is nothing on this list that wasn't on Tina's list. Um, the first thing is uh, be a cooperative team member. The teachers value you in that team, not just in your classroom, but in their grade level in that school. Um, have good communication, whether that is an email saying uh, that you're going to be uh, staying late tonight and working on these things, is that the right thing to do? Um, being prepared for your lessons, and uh, not that everybody has to do this, but uh, one of our student teachers not only did the lessons for her class, but for the entire grade level. That kind of blew us away. Um, engage outside of the classroom. And they're talking about the engagement in the school community as well as the community at large and, and being a, an active member of the place where you want to be. Um, they talked about going to games, performances, letting the kids see you in a setting where you're not the one on the stage, but you're celebrating them being on the stage. That was something that really came through. Um, the last one is the relationships. Every single nomination talked about how important those relationships are, whether it's relationships with your students, the parents, the other teachers, or the administrators. These were the main things that every one of our student teachers that was nominated this year or this fall really demonstrated in their placements. So we're going to challenge each of our student teachers going out to really excel in those areas as well. All right, I tried to buy you a little bit of time to think of your advice. Um, when I call your name, please come up and uh, Dr. Pennington is going to give you your planner for spring 2024. I'm a notoriously bad name reader. If I mispronounce your name, just uh, pretend I didn't. And I'm going to apologize up front. Brianna Burgum. Jean Blackman. Luli Campos. Garrett Kuhn. Kate Davidson. Hannah Fisher. Cassidy Green. All right, Ginny, cancel her placement. <laughs> Addie Harris. Audrey Malcolm. Olivia Powers. Hallie Snell. Brittany Steiger. <laughs> Ellie Stern. <laughs> Shelby Stump. <laughs> Signe West. Katie Comack. Claire Reardon. Lily Sherman. Reagan Cosgrove.
Did anybody sneak in after I grabbed the list? All right. Now it's your turn. All right, you're closest to me. Okay. Would you like to start or would you like to punt to the other side of the room? Hold. Can I punt down there? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> good luck. Sorry. No, it's all good. Oh, geez. My advice to you guys um, take on all the opportunities and experiences that you are given and um, what else was I going to say? Uh, yeah, that's good. Otherwise you can read up there. I would say make connections in and outside the classroom. The people you meet may know more in a topic that you're not strong at and they'll help you get to where you can help someone else. And that is, I think, the real goal in teaching is passing that knowledge on. Um, my advice would be take a lot of notes during PRAC 1 and PRAC 2 about the things you like and the things that you wouldn't necessarily do in your own classroom. It's very helpful. Um, I would say trust the process, but don't rush the process because your time in this program goes by a lot faster than you think it will. Um, I would say network yourself if you are looking for a job or even if you just want to get experience in the classroom, network yourself and be confident. And also keep I don't know, I keep everything that the kids give me. I know like when I probably am teaching for 10 years, I'll have like a whole dresser full of stuff, but I don't know, when you're having a bad day or you're like, why am I doing this? You just can look at it and it'll make you feel happy. Take your time. This is, I'm a five year senior, got friends who are six year seniors in this program and it's awesome. Don't worry if you can't take the same classes as your friends, you're just gonna make new ones. So take your time and don't worry about it. Um, my piece of advice would be to be open-minded. You might think, you think one way about something like a grade level or a subject or anything like that, but your opinions could totally change based on your experience. So just be open-minded. I would say don't be afraid to jump in with the kids. The best way to learn is to jump in and like, don't be afraid to learn from them, too, because they're, in all actuality, the best teachers. I would say show up to class and, <laughs> and also take every opportunity that you get to go into the classroom. I would say to kind of just do anything you can outside of, outside of classes, outside of school, like tutoring, substitute coach, anything else on top of what you're already doing in the classroom, and then ask a bunch of questions. I think I sat with my CT for like 20 minutes and just was like, 40 questions right now, are you ready to go? And that was super helpful. Um, all of those are really good. <laughs> I would say don't forget to ask questions. It's not anything to be scared of. Your CT is there to help you, and she knows that you're learning, or he knows you're learning, so take their advantage of asking everything. My advice would be to be optimistic throughout the process and form good relationships with your students, your CTs, and your professors. My advice would be to stay on top of your deadlines. You're having so much fun out there that you tend to lose track of time and it sneaks up on you faster than you would think. Um, my advice is to Create the relationships with your classmates and your friends because you are going to rely on them so heavily. And also, just like also a little plug, but get to know Marcy and Joe because the rural route opens every opportunity for you. So get to know them too. Um, I would have to say make the most of this field experience time that you have. Like, it's not like you can't make mistakes in your own classroom, but this is really your time to try new things and be brave, be bold. My advice is to be really flexible, whether it be in your classes here at MSU or when you're in the classroom. Um, 
being able to adjust to every situation is super important, especially while teaching. You might have a lesson that you think is going to go one way, and then five seconds before you start, you have to change the whole thing. So being flexible is really helpful and makes it a little less stressful if you are good at adjusting to those situations. Hello. My advice, I have two things. One is I worked as a para, I've worked as a para for the last couple years and it's seriously the best. And I loved it and I learned so much and it's so fun to just like feel a part of a school and you really get to see the impact of the relationships and also laugh and have fun. I know that sounds silly but sometimes you can be like, Bruh, but you can like joke around with, with the kids. It's so fun, so yeah. Okay, it's my turn now, sorry. Um, so I would say when you're doing your lesson plans, they may get long, um, but I try to do them cross-curricular. So there's a couple different lesson activities and it just seems to really benefit the students. Um, I really like including creative arts into say math um, and they get to do a little art project, especially with the younger grades. Um, so it's really fun, so be open-minded to that. Well, thank you all for your, your great advice. Um, Ginny and I were making notes as well, because uh, you had a lot of really good, important points uh, on how to be successful in this program. Before you sit down, we'd like to get you together for one group photo with uh, Dr. Pennington before we head out to student teaching. So I'm gonna look up to Bill and see if he has all of you in the frame or if we have to scooch. As you're going back to your seats, uh, we want to wish all of you uh, a safe journey. We have people literally going across the entire globe next semester, and uh, we can't wait to have all of you back in May, watch you cross the stage, and hear all of the great stories that you have to share when you come back and see us then. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank all of you for coming. It was great to see everybody, and uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your Tuesday evening.